Hello, and welcome to this lesson on how to utilize concurrency in the TWS API. We will be discussing how to utilize multiple concurrent requests in the API to create a rudimentary trading system. Please be aware that this program will be referencing nearly all of the prior lessons discussed in this course, and will assume that the underlying behavior of these functions is already understood. This lesson focuses on utilizing these individual pieces together for a more cohesive system. Therefore, we have already resolved the code beforehand, and instead we can step through each piece instead of our typical format. It is extremely important for users to operate this script exclusively in a paper trading environment. This is not meant as trading advice and is intended for learning purposes only. As a general statement on the matter, concurrency is the process of handling one or more calculations or operations simultaneously. This would allow us to do something like calculate our account values while retrieving continuous market data and placing trades in the background with simultaneous execution monitoring. We'll start our script with the same standard build we have used throughout the tutorial series. After establishing our imports, I will create two dictionaries to use throughout our program which are bank and position ref. We will leave these for now and jump down to after we've called our run loop. I will make a call to rec account updates with the subscribe parameter set to true, so we can maintain a constant feed of our account data. Our update account value field will be very limited in scope in this implementation. I'm going to exclusively filter out the total cash balance key in use with the base currency value. Since I am only planning to trade in my base currency of USD, I don't care to review my other values. If your base currency is something else, such as CAD, then you may want to specify USD here. Within our if statement, I will create another if statement that will disconnect my application if the val value goes below 1 million USD. This isn't technically necessary, Though this is a very simple failsafe to make sure my code doesn't run my account into the ground. Next, I can put a request to app.recpositions after our rec account updates call. We had touched on this in a previous lesson, but this function will return data through our eWrapper.position method and take updates for our entire portfolio so we can keep track of our accounts as we trade. Within the eWrapper function, I will include the contract.symbol value as a key and set it equal to the position value. That way, I know a symbol like Apple will carry a certain position value throughout the day. I will be implementing this later on to make sure that my account does not trigger any short positions. Moving along, we can start moving into our symbol discovery. I am going to utilize a market scanner to decide the trending contracts of the day. However, this stage could also utilize an array of predefined contracts instead. For my scanner subscription object, I will mirror my prior lesson by focusing on major US stock exchanges. This time though, I will utilize most active for my scan code, so I can monitor the major companies like Nvidia, Apple, or Tesla. I will also only filter the exchanges with average volume above a million and a price above $10 so I can filter out relatively small companies. Then I can send out a request for our market scanner. For the eWrapper method, I will actually filter the results with an if statement to only those with a rank value under five. That way, we can just trade the top five stocks on any given day. Within our statement, I'll first define a new value, rank ID, which is just the sum of our rec ID and rank and have an easy integer to track our market data. Then we'll set our rank ID to our bank dictionary and have it reference the contract object. This way we can equate our market data with our symbol with ease. Now let's set the contract symbol in our position ref dictionary to zero. This is to instantiate a position value to further prevent any short position. All this data can go out now and create a live market data request. I won't be using it this time, though you are welcome to declare delayed market data if necessary. Finally, I'll print out my top ranking contracts so I have a frame of reference to look back on. 
I will also cancel my market scanner through the scanner data end function this time as well. However, I will not disconnect the program. You may have noticed that this was the first time we have printed any details throughout the script so far. The reason for this is because our program is written to work independently of myself. So the printing is primarily for our tutorial and could be ignored. The same goes for all future print references, though in production environments, it would be advised to log these types of values to validate in the future. Before diving into our next methods, let's recap what we've programmed so far to largely happen simultaneously. We first requested account updates to maintain a constant check on our account balance. In my case, I've instructed the program to simply disconnect once I drop beneath a certain threshold. After beginning that loop, I built out a request for position updates to prevent my account from shorting. Finally, I've created a market scanner subscription to receive the most active instruments and requested market data for them. Even though the only concurrent requests here are to place market data subscriptions, remember that all of these requests are operating against the run loop, which would have otherwise locked out our request after the first had we not implemented threading. Now we can move on to making requests happen concurrently. With our request for market data happening concurrently, I'm going to build out tick price to handle my logic. If I was concerned about things like tick size or tick generic values, I could build similar logic because of my bank dictionary's use of the request ID as a tracking metric. Starting out, I will create an initial if statement to check if the last tick type is already in my bank rec ID's keys. If the value is not there, I will simply assign last to the current price, even though the initial run will largely be skipped because the price will be the same, this will save us any errors moving forward. Afterwards, I'll create a variable, bank tick, and set it to my existing last value. I will also create a reference to the existing contract value we set in the scanner data function by calling it bank contract. After setting our variables, we can move into some order placement logic. I will create a generic order object only containing the time and force, quantity, and order type. In my case, I am only operating with market orders, though calculating a limit price would be easy enough as well. With an order object set, I can do a quick if-else check for last price differences greater than 5% or less than 6%. These statements will determine if a potential action buy or sell, and then submit my affiliated order. I can submit these orders using my next ID method, my bank contract contract, and then our new order object. In addition to the percentage calculations for my sell logic, I am also going to check if the contract's position is at least 5, so I don't short. And to cap off my function, I'll set my contract's last price to my current price to reference in the next iteration of comparison. Now, for additional tracking metrics, I can create a reference to open order and exec details. In my case, I will format them as an easy to read format so I can glance at the execution behavior. I am just printing rejected orders from my open orders response, though it would stand to print all details from something like a limit order, which may not be expected to execute immediately. As mentioned before, this is technically an optional step as it is solely used for viewing purposes. Users may look to log things like execution prices and order details for an end of day review. To recap our order behavior since our last, we are now acknowledging the five market data requests and on each tick we are calculating whether or not an order should be triggered based on our very simple logic. Once the market data fits our criteria, we launch out an order and we can find updates later in the open order or exact details methods. We are now completely done with the script and with any luck, we can earn some simulated dollars. In a relatively short span of time, we were able to construct an entirely automated system to trade throughout the day. There's plenty of room for improvement and flexibility from our other lessons but this is an excellent scenario to gain some confidence in making concurrent requests and handling multiple actions simultaneously. Users interested in learning more should look to implement defensive trading logic 
such as trading bracket orders rather than our simple market orders that were discussed in the complex order lesson. Alternatively, you may want to create logic around historical trends for our scan contracts rather than plucking the top five to ensure safer trading. This concludes our lesson on utilizing concurrency in the TWS API. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please be sure to review our documentation or leave a comment below this video. Thank you for following along throughout this series.